Turn to your neighbor and tell him, not in my house. And you may be seated. Praise the Lord. I love the energy this morning. You know, so it's, it's so powerful just to see what God is doing in our church and in this time. You know, this season and in this time, you know, we're believing God for a great harvest. And we truly believe that that's the plan and the agenda of God for our church, that we are believing for a big harvest. How many are believing for a big harvest? But I also believe that God also has a personal harvest for you. And the reason why is because when you look at the Bible, when you look at the journey that Israel had, any time there was expansion in God's house, what it did, it began to flow into their house. See, per, see corporate expansion begins to produce personal expansion. But why does God give us personal expansion? Because personal expansion produces kingdom expansion. You are a part of the kingdom of God. You are a part of the plan of God. The Bible says that before he formed you, he knew you. He began to form your purpose. Isaiah and Psalms begins to talk about how God created our purpose before we took our first breath. Your purpose, and you're here on purpose for a purpose. Many of you are reading uh, The Purpose Driven Life, right? How many women are reading The Purpose Driven Life? And you're beginning to understand that you're here on purpose for a purpose. That God has given you a special purpose. But when we come together as a people, when we come together as a church, how many know that we, became, we, we become unstoppable. You know, it's so powerful to begin a journey through the Bible and journey through his word. And when you begin to look at Joshua, the book of Joshua is the bridge. It's a bridge between the first five books of the Bible and the next seven books of the Bible. Why? Because the first five books of the Bible talk about Israel outside of the promised land. But the next seven books of the Bible begin to talk about Israel in the promised land. How many know Israel had a promise? God gave to Abraham a promise that they were going to be, begin to come into their own place, come into their own land. But did you know that it took about 600 years for that promise to be accomplished? See, God may not move in our time, God may not move in our calendar. God may not move in our time clock. But how many know eventually God will fulfill his word? God will fulfill his promise. See, you may have a promise for God, and, and maybe you've been waiting. Well, I'm here to let you know the people of God waited 600 years. So how many know another month is okay? That it's okay to wait. You know why? Because in the waiting season, what God is doing is God is preparing us. In the waiting season, what God is doing, God is preparing his people to handle the promotion. God is preparing his people to handle the blessing. God is preparing his people to handle the inheritance. God is preparing his people to handle the breakthrough. God is preparing you in this place for something big. How many believe that this morning? Because he just doesn't give us what we plan for. How many know he gives us what we prepare for? As we do a little recap of the first five books, well, we know that the book of Genesis is the book of beginnings, right? The book of Genesis is the creation, the creation of heaven, the creation of earth, the creation and the birth of a nation. We begin a journey into the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus is the book of deliverance. This is the book... That is about the bondage and the deliverance of Israel. Then we begin to look at, look at the book of Leviticus. The book of Leviticus, I don't know if you know this, but every Hebrew child, the first book that they needed to memorize was the book of Leviticus. That's not an easy book, right? By 12 years old, they needed to know all five books. But the first book that they needed to memorize was this book right here, the book of Leviticus. The book of Leviticus is actually 
a book of worship. It is the book of worship. It is the instruction on how to approach a holy God. How many know when we come to God and when we approach God, how many know we should approach him with reverence, with honor? And that's so important to understand that Leviticus was their instruction. They had no manual. Before this, they were so happy when they got the book of Leviticus. They rejoiced when they got the book of Leviticus. Because before that, all they had was the faith of their forefathers. This is how my father worshipped. This is how my father's father worshipped. This is how my father's 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 worshipped. And that's how I'm going to worship. But how many know that, that the people of God, they, they needed instruction because our ways are not his ways and our thoughts are not his thoughts. And, and when God begins to instruct his people, that's why he told Joshua, be careful that you do everything in this word, that you commit your life to this word. Because when you commit your life to the word, your life will be prosperous and successful. Sometimes in our own way, we're making a way, but how many know God will make Ways where there seems to be no way. In the natural, we could try to work things out. In the natural, we could try to put things together. In the natural, we could try to fix things. But how many know sometimes we make things worse? When we get in the way of God. And that's why they needed Leviticus. Because when Leviticus began to give them the instruction on how to approach a holy God, then they were able to truly honor God. The book of Numbers is the book of wandering. Because they doubted and they did not keep the law, they began to wander in the desert. The book of Deuteronomy is a recap. It's a recap of the former books. The, God begins to repeat some important things. And the reason why is because he needed to remind them. Sometimes we forget. Sometimes we forget. But how many know sometimes when God begins to remind us and God begins to refresh us and God begins to, you ever read something and it, it said something, it says something different? The reason why is because you're in a new season. The reason why is because you're in a different season. You can read verses in the Bible and you can begin to, 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 to study God's word, you know, but next year it, it may mean something different. Why? Because how many know we're in a different season? And it's not that God's word is changing. It's not that the interpretation is changing. You know, there's only one interpretation of the word. But how many know that one interpretation produces multiple applications? Because at the end of the day, it's not about information. How many know it's about transformation? And God will begin to minister to your life and speak to your life. Deuteronomy is the book of repetition. In this book, God repeats some important things. Moses gives three farewell speeches in this book on the plains of Moab overlooking the promised land. They weren't in the promised land yet. Imagine gathering together and we look outside and there's the promised land. There's Jericho. And they're probably thinking, man, we've been in this desert 40 years. We've probably seen that view a few times. Throughout our lifetime. But Moses was telling the people, it's time. Prepare yourself. It's time. But don't forget. He was telling the people, don't forget. He was reminding them of the law. He was reminding them of principles. He was reminding them of the importance of honoring God. Because when they got to the land, they were about to approach not just the enemy, but the gods of the enemy. And this was so important for us to understand. That that's why Paul begins to t tell us and compel us. And he begins to say, don't get entangled in the affairs and the cares of the world. That's why Jesus said, don't worry. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. He said, pagans worry about those things. He said, but seek first the kingdom of God. Put, first, put, put God first within your life. And that's why Joshua said that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That was his life statement. That was his mission statement. From the beginning all the way to the end. In the beginning, Joshua was the servant of Moses. 
But at the end, in Joshua 24, he became the servant of the Lord. And that's important. You know, it's a process, and, and, and that's why, you know, God places leadership within our life to teach us honor, to teach us obedience, to teach us leadership. I thank God for the leaders within my life. And that prepares us to serve God. David was the servant of Saul, but at the end of his life, he became the servant of the Lord. God is preparing you. God is preparing you. That's why it's so important that we do things in the right spirit. That's why we do things in the right motive. That's why the Apostle Paul told the Colossians that when you serve, serve not that you're doing it to man, but that you're doing it unto the Lord. Because how many know when you're doing it unto the Lord, how many know there's joy? When you're doing it unto the Lord, how many know there's fruit? When you're doing it unto the Lord, you're able to enjoy the fruit of your labor. You're not looking for natural approval. You're looking for God's approval. And it's so important that as God places leaders within your life, that you continue to serve in the right spirit. Don't just be known as an earthly servant. Be known as the servant of the Lord. You begin to see that Joshua was a bridge. He was a bridge between the people being out of the promise to the people going into the promise. He was able to be used to take the people from wanderers into warriors. Joshua was powerful. Joshua had so many great qualities. Joshua, he wasn't just a servant, but he was a great leader. He was a loyal follower. God blessed him because he was a loyal follower. He was a true servant. God began to bless him because he was a great warrior. Some scholars even say that he was possibly even a part of the army of Egypt. If you date back some history, they say he was possibly a part of the army of Egypt. And he was able to learn some things in battle. Joshua was a great warrior, conqueror. Joshua was a great leader. But what I love is Joshua was used to bring a shift. Last week we heard that, that we're in a new shift. Last year we heard that we're in a new era. Last, last week, I'm sorry, we heard that we're in a new era, that we're in a new shift, that God is doing something new. How many are anticipating the new that God is doing? He's doing something new. God is doing something new in our church. God is doing something new in the body. I thank God that we serve a progressive God. I say, I thank God that we serve a God that goes from glory to glory. I thank God that he just doesn't bless a 60, but he also blesses 80 and 100 times full. I thank God that he just didn't come to give us life, but he came to give us life more abundantly. How I many thank God this morning? He's a progressive God. He was going to progress the people. He was going to do something new. But before God brings a shift... He prepares a shifter. As Elijah was bringing about a shift, God was preparing Elisha. As King David was bringing a shift in the nation, God was preparing Solomon. As Jesus was bringing a shift on the earth, how many know he was preparing his disciples? As Moses was bringing a shift, how I many know God was preparing Joshua? Before God brings a shift, he prepares a shifter. And why is this so important for us to understand? Because that word shift means to bring change. God wants to make you a change agent. God just doesn't want you to live your life for yourself, but he wants you to bring change. He wants you to model change. He wants you to produce change. I mean, oh, God has called us to bring change. But before he brings change, he prepares you to bring that change. What are some qualities that Joshua had? Well, one of the qualities that he had that's so powerful is that Joshua fought with confidence. 
You know, there's three types of people in the church. You have the seers that watch things happen. You have the settlers that are always asking what's happening. But then you have the shifters. You have the shifters. You have the people that are partnering with the agenda of God. You have people that are saying, you know what, I've committed my ways to the Lord because I know when I commit my ways to the Lord that my plans will succeed. You have people in the house that say, you know what, my life is not my own. I thank God that Joshua was saying, you know what, it's not just for me and my family. He said, as for me and my household. Everybody that I touch, everybody that I'm connected to, everybody that is within my sphere of influence. He said, as for me and my house, uh, we will serve the Lord. He fought with confidence. It's a battle. We're in a battle. And, and, and when Joshua began to, 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 to go into Jericho and as they began to cross the Jordan... You know, his job wasn't to seek out the enemy. His job wasn't to say, all right, I'm going to send some spies and I want you to give me a number. How many Philistines are in the land? His job was to honor the Lord because the battle belonged to the Lord. That's why when he was reminding the people in Joshua 24, he was saying it was God that conquered the land. It was God that conquered these people. It was God that was with us. All we had to do is march around Jericho seven times, worshiping, praising, serving, honoring God. And he said, God gave us a great victory. I mean, no, the battle belongs to him. That as long as you're honoring the Lord, that as long as you're saying that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As long as you're saying, you know what, we're going to serve God and God alone. We're not going to serve our circumstance. How many know the, the enemy's plan is to bring pain? The enemy's plan is to bring pressure. The enemy's plan is to bring problems. But those of you that say, not in my house. Those of you that say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What you're saying is I'm inviting the power of God. I'm inviting the presence of God. I'm inviting the purpose of God. I'm inviting the provision of God within my house. Because as long as we serve him and honor him, I mean, all those things are just a byproduct of serving the Lord. Of honoring him. That's why he was able to fight with confidence. Because he knew who God was and he knew who he was in God. You know, the enemy is after the identity of the people. That's why you have so many pronouns, and that's why you have so many things that are taking place. You don't know, people are saying, call me him, her, this, and that. Because the enemy is after the identity. The enemy's agenda is to destroy the identity and to take the identity. But how many know we're a child of God? How many know you're a son of God? How many know you're a daughter of God? You're a son of the king. You're a daughter of the king. God has called you by name, not by a pronoun. Come on, somebody. Can we talk about it this morning? You're called. Fight with confidence. Know that God is with you. Know that his strength is with you. Know that his peace is with you. Know that his power is with you. Don't go into a circumstance not knowing. I'm here to let you know. I'm here to remind you that God is with you and everything that you need, you have. He fought with confidence. He was confident. Number two, he focused on the cause. He focused on the cause. See, in this day and age, we need change agents. In this day and age, we need some shifters. In this day and age, Pastor Sonny started a shift. But he's passing it on. He's passing it on to our church. He's passing it on to the leadership. He's passing it on to the leadership of our ministry. He's saying, continue the shift. Where the plan? There's no plan B in the kingdom. You're the plan. 
So don't just fight with confidence, but focus on the cause. The enemy is after your purpose. Not only is he after your identity, he's after your purpose. His purpose is to kill, steal, and destroy. But how many know God's agenda is for you to bring life, for you to bring change, for you to heal others, for you to help others? We can only do that when we're focused on the cause. Circumstance wants us to be focused on ourself and our circumstance. And I know situations sometimes are tough. And I know situations some, sometimes come unexpected. But I'm here to let you know that God is with you. And as long as God is with you, you're able to fight with confidence. You're able to focus on the cause. And you're able to see great victories within your life. He was faithful in the past. How many know he's going to continue to be faithful? You're able to fight with compassion. You're able to focus on the cause, but also number three, what you see within the life of Joshua is that he was filled with compassion. Filled with compassion. In this season, in this time, it's so important that we walk with compassion. We walk with compassion. The church is a group of imperfect people serving a perfect God. I know sometimes there's misunderstandings. I know sometimes when brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so doesn't say hi, it ruins your day. But it's all right. God still loves you. It's all right. God is still with you. It's all right. You serve the Lord. It's all right. Walk with compassion. You never know. They might be having a bad day. They might need you to be the one to say hi. They might need you to be the one to say, hey, can I pray for you? Can, how, how can I help you? How can I be there for you? But how many know compassion does that? But when we're just focused on our circumstance, then it becomes about me, myself, and I. We all have a circumstance. We all have a situation. But how many know God has the solution? We can try to figure it out. We can try to fix it. Sometimes the people of God were trying to fix it and try to say, God, I, I think I found a better way. When God is just saying, just seek my will. Just seek my word. Just seek my ways because my will is good. It's pleasing. It's perfect. It's going to work out. It's going to work out. Let me thank God that it's going to work out. When Joshua was making this final statement, and they can come this morning. When Joshua was making this final statement, he was full of compassion. Because Joshua just wasn't saying, well, I'm going to serve the Lord. But he said, as for me and my house. Some of your translations say household. He was thinking about the next generation. Not just his family, but his legacy. The next generation. The ones that we're going to come after. See, the only ones that entered the promised land from the original generation was Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb. So Joshua, Caleb, and a whole new group of people enter the promised land. They begin to fight. Some of the battles in the book of Joshua are, are some of the most gruesome battles. I remember one time I was reading the book of Joshua and I just had to put it away. I go, man, this is, this is worse than any movie. <laughs> but God was saying, I need you to wipe everything out. You know why? Because he knew. He knew that for years, that for centuries, that for decades, people... Or worshiping the Baals. 
the God of their land. The Baal was their God of, of, of produce, of fertility. They would do all kinds of crazy things. You've, you've heard the message. You've read it in the Word. They would do all kinds of crazy things to get the attention of the Baals. Meanwhile, the statue is just not doing anything. But the reason why he was telling them, we want, I want you to wipe everything out because he was, he, he was saying it's not just about serving false gods, but it's also about serving God falsely. That if you begin to see how they begin to worship God and you begin to see how they begin to worship their gods and they begin to do things in the natural, then it's going to take your focus away from, from God, the one true God. And what do you see in the book of Judges that they would have Baals and they would try to worship God at the same time? It didn't work. They ended back in slavery. They went from conquerors to compromisers. Which resulted in what? Chaos. They went from shifters to settlers in the land. We got to fight with confidence. We got to focus on the cause. We got to be filled with compassion. There was so much compassion in Joshua. So much compassion because he understood that he was a bridge. We need bridges. We need bridges. Your job is to be a bridge. It was so wonderful that last month, a couple of weeks ago, we had our founders with us. And man, they just wanted to be with us. They love you. They love our church. How many thank God for our founders? Some of the most down to earth, but some of the most powerful people that that are walking the face of the earth. So, and we have, the beautiful thing about our church is we're multi-generational. You have the Moses generation. You have the Joshua generation. There's generations that have gone before us that have said, as for me and my house, there's generations that have gone before. You're here today because of the declaration of somebody else. How many thank God for those that have gone before you? How many thank God for those that have never wavered? I thank God for my parents. I've been in this ministry 39 years because my parents said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I honor them. But ultimately, the decision was up to me. Ultimately, I had to make the decision for myself. And you got to be able to declare and stand on that declaration for yourself. And personalize it. Because God is calling you to be the bridge. You may not say, well, I'm Moses, all the way Moses, or, or all the way Joshua. I got saved in... Y2K, right? Y2K. <laughs> the year 2000. I was like, what am I? Joshua? Gang? I don't know. God said, you're a bridge. You're a bridge. You're a bridge. Between the next generation and the generation that is to come. And he gave me a burden for the next generation. He gave me a burden. And I believe many of you, God wants to give you that burden. You're fighting. You're confident. But how many know we got to be filled with compassion? I believe God's going to give you a fresh passion, a fresh compassion for your family, a fresh passion, a fresh compassion for your loved ones. Maybe you haven't talked to them in years, but I'm. You're the bridge. You're the bridge. You're the answer. You're the one that has to make the declaration. And you're the one that has to say, you know what? Not in my house. Not in my house. You know what's going to happen? I love what Jesus said. Jesus 
was sharing this parable about the shrewd manager. One of the most interesting parables, I think, of all his parables. He was talking about how this shrewd manager, he knew that he was about to get let go by his, by his boss. He said what he did was he used the owner's resources and the owner's debts, and he began to tell people, your debt's cut in half. Just pay this much. As a matter of fact, what Jesus said is he was using the owner's money to buy friends. And Jesus called him shrewd. Jesus called him wise. And why did he say this? He said, because that's how we have to think. That we have access to the owner. That we have full access to the owner's resources. And he goes, use the owner's resources to buy friends. You know what he was saying? To save people. He said, why did he say this? Because in the conclusion, he said, because when you get to your heavenly dwelling, they will thank you. When you get to your heavenly dwelling, they will say, thank you for giving. Thank you for sowing. Thank you for declaring. Thank you for believing. Thank you for using God's resources to save my life. And because of your commitment, because of your generosity, because of your commitment, I made it. I just didn't make it. My family made it. Say, use God's resources to save as many people as you can. That's what we're doing. That's what we're believing for. That's why we're believing for a great harvest. In the first service, it was just so special just to see many people begin to write names. Some people even brought pictures. And what they said is they say, you know what, I'm believing God for some miracles. Maybe there's a loved one in your life that needs healing. Maybe there's some loved ones in your life that need salvation. Maybe there's some loved ones in your life that that, that at one time were serving the Lord but are no longer serving the Lord. Maybe there's some loved ones within your life that you say, you know what? I got to be the bridge. I got to be the bridge. I can't stand to see them suffer no longer. That's why I believe God is going to give you a fresh compassion. We're saying enough is enough. David, uh, uh, Joshua said enough is enough. Choose today whom you will serve. What do the people say? We're going to serve the Lord. That word serve, you see 15 times just in that chapter. The word serve means work and worship. So as for me and my house, we're going to work for the Lord. As for me and my house, we're going to worship the Lord. As for me and my house, we're not going to waver. We're not going to compromise. Because how many know when you make that declaration, how many know you live by that declaration, how many know great things will begin to flow through your house? So if you have not an opportunity to begin to write some names down, I want you to take that opportunity this morning. If you need some paper, we have some paper. Just lift up your hands. But what I want you to do is I want you to begin to write some names. Not only do I want you to write some names that you're believing for, I want you to begin to write down some households. Begin to pray for those households. Begin to pray. Begin to write them down. I pray for the Gonzalez household. I pray for the Garcia household. I pray for the... Begin to write those households down. We're believing God for some big things this year, church. We're believing God for some great things this year, church. Because of this declaration, because of this promise, I believe because of this miracle wall, we're going to see some great things. A number of years ago, on a Good Friday, we were writing some names at these on these stairs, and I, I began to believe God for my sister, and I began to write her name down, and believe God for her marriage, and believe God. And wouldn't you know that three days later, she gave her life to the Lord. Oh, God can move fast. It's about his timing. Because his timing is the right time. So 
I see you, many of you, you're writing these names down and you're believing God and you're probably wondering, why a wall? Why are we using a wall? We've used a cross. We've used these stairs, which represents the altar. You're just probably thinking, why a wall? Well, I did a study. And in God's word, the wall represents protection. It represents security. It represents shelter. And it represents a place of belonging. This is all from the word. These are things that you could declare over your family. These are things that you could believe for your family. And these are sovereign moments that the Lord gives us. These are monumental moments. That's why in the Jordan, they begin to put the stones. It was a monument to remember. When everybody made that witness... And begin to say, we will serve the Lord just as you're serving the Lord, Joshua. He said, we're going to set a stone as a remembrance, as a memorial. That's what we're doing this morning. So this morning as we begin to stand together, we're going to pray. We're going to unite our faith. One can send a thousand to flight. But how many know two can send ten thousand to flight? What does that mean? We're stronger together. We're going to unite our faith. We're going to believe God for the impossible. Some of you, you're, you've been believing for years. Some of you, you've been praying for years. Some of you, you've been praying for a long time. Some of you have been saying, you know what? I'm believing. I'm praying. I'm declaring. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to bring these names to the altar. We're going to pray together. We're going to band our faith together. And then after that, we're going to make our way to the wall. But at first, what I want you to do is I want you to begin to come. I want you to begin to bring those names. And I want you to begin to come to the altars. We're going to unite our faith together. We're going to pray together. We're going to get ready to sing this song. But I want you to begin to come. And we're going to declare. We're going to unite our faith. That's it. Begin to come. Because we have to commit it to the Lord first. We have to commit these names to the Lord first. We have to declare. We have to make a declaration. We have to make a stand this morning. Come on, come with compassion. Come with love. Come with faith. Come with strength. Come with confidence. 